I gave this overly ambitious title uh, that sounds like I'm going to cover everything we know about galaxies and dark matter halos. Um, in practice, I probably will just uh, review a few things that uh, you might have heard about before but have now been published and finalized over the last year. And then I'll just highlight just a couple of issues that I think are particularly interesting and relevant, which are sort of both technical issues but also things with um, qu uh, quite important physical implications. So I always like to start with a movie. And the point of this movie, uh, which is actually the formation of a massive galaxy cluster, um, is really just to emphasize the fact that we really think that every single galaxy lives in a clump of dark matter. And so really, the first thing we should be trying to do in galaxy formation is trying to understand how galaxies relate to this, uh, to this beautiful uh, picture here that we now can map out very well with numerical simulations. So the key um, thing here is to think about these statistics. And uh, this, this plot is just the average number, in this case, in a dark matter simulation, the average number of subhalos as a function of halo mass. And the interesting thing about this plot, which has these two basic features, basically a power law of satellites, and then this shelf of central galaxies, um, I, I find it quite amazing that this basically seems to hold for any mass or luminosity selected sample that we have looked at so far in the universe where it's been well probed. Um, so it's not necessarily true for color selected samples, but essentially any mass selected sample of galaxies seems to have this basic relationship to its dark matter halo with this relationship between sort of the mass that hosts one galaxy and the mass that hosts two galaxies um, being different by of order 20 in mass. So this basic uh, approach that we've been studying in some detail um, is abundance matching, basically connecting galaxies to their halos one to one, including the substructures, with some parameters. So um, the early versions of these, we use zero parameters. I would now say we have a few parameters, and we can actually constrain those parameters. So the basic idea is just the simplest idea that there is, that galaxies live in halos, and there's some property of those galaxies that's related to properties of, of halos. You also need to assume that, that that's not a strong function of the large scale environment well outside the virial radius of the objects. Um, and then you basically use the counts of something you can measure, for example, the luminosity function, to connect to some property of the halo that you can measure. Okay? And the key thing that I want to emphasize today is that some of these details, although this basic picture is quite simple, some of these details matter and we actually can can now probe them with observations. So which galaxy or which halo property are we talking about? How tightly are they correlated? What's the scatter? Um, including satellite galaxies properly, so the relationship between the stellar mass of a satellite versus a central um, at a given halo property, and how much the halo formation history um, impacts galaxies at a given mass. But so far, really pretty simple versions of these, which just have a few parameters, um, seem to explain almost everything that we've measured about sort of luminosity or mass selected samples of galaxies. And we think we can use this basic approach to actually learn a lot more. So just reminding you, for those who haven't thought about this before, basically what we're doing is sort of taking the massive galaxies and putting them in massive halos with some relationship and some scatter between these. Okay? So the key thing, and I'll emphasize this again, is that you actually need to resolve in your simulation every substructure that you expect to host a galaxy. Anatoly will probably talk more about this after me. So I have just addressed a few of these questions, and I'm actually not even going to address some of the most interesting ones. But um, I'll talk a little bit about the scatter. What are the uncertainties? Um, what are the uncertainties in actually the absolute mass and luminosity scale? And what can we infer about galaxy formation physics? So most of what I'll be talking about is based on this Bolshoi simulation, but we've done uh, work with several other uh, simulations, um, including uh, up to sort of a gigaparsec with a few times 10 to the 9 solar mass particles. 
And um, in order to, uh, to fully take advantage of this, we've built some new tools to find halos and to track their histories over time. We found that the accuracy of these tools matters quite a lot. Um, so we worked hard to get this right. Both the tools, the halo finder and the merger tree, and the catalogs based on this simulation um, are now publicly available. And I encourage you to play around with them. Ask me if you have any questions. So um, I first mentioned some work done by Rachel Reddick, who you heard from this morning. This was a paper published earlier this year, where we actually looked at many different uh, possible ways to associate galaxies with halos um, based on different properties. So you probably can't read what all of these properties are. But I don't actually think that matters too much. The key thing that's different between these properties is how much the satellites uh, are stripped compared to the central galaxies. So when satellite galaxies enter their host halo, they start getting stripped. And in these different algorithms, we basically have a different relationship between, um, between the satellites and centrals that results in a different satellite fraction at a given observable. And that's really the main thing that we're able to constrain with these observations. So I think that's the important thing to pay attention to. Here we're looking at the correlation function uh, for different stellar mass samples. And here the satellite fraction. So what we did was explore this parameter space, both of this proxy, how much something is allowed to get stripped before, while where it's still called a galaxy, and then also how much scatter. And here I'll just show the best fit model. Um, the key point here is that the model works extremely well. This model basically has one choice of, param uh, of parameter to match the halo, and then two, uh, two free parameters. But other than that, it's all set by the dark matter simulations. And you can see it provides a very, very good fit to the data. One of the key things that we're doing here is that in addition to using the correlation function, we, always, we also use the relationship between galaxies and their groups. So this is the conditional stellar mass function. We do everything in observables. So running a group finder on the data and the simulation in exactly the same way. So here we're looking at the luminosity function in massive halos and the luminosity function in, in low mass groups, where you typically just have one or two objects. And so with those statistics, you're able to get quite good constraints on these parameters. So this shows the constraint on the scatter, um, which is now constrained basically to be you know, about 0.18 or so um, decks in uh, stellar mass at a given halo property. In this case, the halo property that we used was the peak circular velocity that the halo ever had. OK, so two points I want you to take away. One is that. Let's say three. One is that this works very well with a small number of parameters. The second is that these group statistics have much more information than just the correlation function alone and allow us to break some interesting degeneracies. Um, and the third is that the real thing that we're constraining is sort of the, the satellite fraction at a given um, observable, like stellar mass, and the scatter. Okay? That's the real thing we're constraining with these data. And then we can talk in detail about whether that actually is telling us something physical about VP. I'll have a few more words to say about that later. Um, just briefly, I want to mention what kind of resolution you need to do this. Um, I think Anatoly might be saying something more about this. Um, so this plot just shows the satellite fraction for many different numerical simulations. Um, with the, the gray lines here show roughly the particle mass of these simulations. So Bolshoi had a little bit better than 2 times 10 to the 8 solar masses. And you can see it gets this satellite fraction uh, to be about 0.3 at the lowest uh, luminosities. Re-emphasizing Anatoly's point, almost all galaxies at any luminosity are centrals. That's always true. Okay, It peaks at about 30%, or at least it, it seems to in everything that at down to um, about minus 17. Uh, but you need quite high resolution. If you use you know, an order of magnitude worse resolution, you can barely do L star galaxies. Okay, So very uh, important to have high resolution. Um, cosmology is not very important, in, at least in matching this kind of thing. So here is the satellite fraction for two different cosmologies. These two different blue things are simulations that 
um, actually have omega matter by, different by, I think, something like 0.7, which is well outside, 0.07, sorry, which is, <laughs> which is well already outside the range that's, um, that's allowed by, by Planck. So um, I, I really like this quote that came out of a recent meeting I was at. Uh, you wouldn't hire the Milky Way to turn gas into stars. Um, so that's true, unless you had to hire some galaxy. Uh, and then you actually would hire the Milky Way because the efficiency of galaxy formation peaks at the mass of the Milky Way. And that actually appears to be true essentially at all redshifts. Um, this plot is basically trying to show two things. One is that galaxy formation is, is very inefficient and peaks at the mass of the Milky Way. And the second is that lots of different uh, methodologies are giving the same basic answer. Okay. So um, from this, I just want to say a few words about the work we've done, uh, led by Peter Beruzzi, um, to basically take this abundance matching technique at one redshift and, and learn take what lessons we learned from that and, and infer the full um, history of galaxy growth. Um, so the basic idea here, you assume some relationship between stellar mass and halo mass. You assume you know how halos grow over time, which we can map out quite well with simulations. And then you use that to infer, so I know how these galaxies, how these halos are populated, and I know how these halos are populated, so that I can learn um, how galaxies grow between these two snapshots and infer what star formation happens, um, not due to uh, just the, the galaxy merging. So um, we have such a model which, apparent, which seems to work very, very well for describing sort of average uh, statistics about galaxies. So we, we constrain this model with the stellar mass function, the cosmic star formation rate, and the specific star formation rate as a function of stellar mass. And basically able to match all the data. And we get this really amazing result that comes out of this work, basically connecting everything we know about galaxies from surveys with everything we know about the growth of dark matter halos. And this is the amazing result, that the star formation efficiency, so I've defined that here as the star formation rate of the central galaxy divided by the halo mass accretion rate of, that, of the halo that hosted that. Um, seems to be, seems to first of all peak at about 10 to the 12 over this entire span of time from basically redshift 4 to the present. And the efficiency itself doesn't seem to change over that entire history. Okay? So typical galaxies are evolving sort of as these white lines. So, so massive galaxies go through this star forming region around 10 to the 12 quite early. That's why they are red, they, they then quench when they get here and don't grow as much even though their halos continue to grow, whereas low mass halos sort of piddle along here um, at low star formation rates over the whole time. So there's a couple of really, really interesting things here. First, so I, so I mentioned already that this efficiency is basically constant over 10 billion years. I find that kind of amazing. Um, about two thirds of all star formation over this entire epoch seems to take place in roughly the mass of the Milky Way. So that's really where the action is. Okay. Um, and the other thing is that the global decline in the star formation rate is actually totally driven by the decline in the, mass, in the halo mass accretion rate. So you can explain it with a constant star formation rate as a function of mass that doesn't change over this time. So, how much time do I have? Um, yeah, uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, you should not have time, but I get it otherwise I'm going to get Okay, good. So I'll just keep talking. Okay, so, okay, good. So, I just want to um, focus now on a couple of issues which I think are, are interesting here. Um, one is, do we actually understand the basic normalization? So um, in, in, the, in Rachel Reddick's paper, uh, we talked about the constraints on the relationship between stellar mass and halo mass. And actually, I'm sure nobody read the whole paper, but there was a long section which had compared different stellar mass estimates in the literature. And it turns out that that totally dominates the uncertainties, right? 
Um, so I want to re-emphasize that point. Um, there's been a couple of papers which have come out recently um, talking about the luminosity function in the local universe. This seems like the most basic thing we can measure about galaxies. I thought we had it right, but um, we're not even close. So, <laughs> so this plot um, just shows this magenta line is the Blanton 2003 result. This is a luminosity function that's probably most widely used. Um, most of the abundance matching results in the literature have used DR7, the Sloan DR7 catalog, which has a luminosity function which is pretty similar to this magenta line. Okay? So all of the clustering results from Sloan, all of these group catalogs that you're looking at, they're all based on this line. Okay? So uh, there then was a paper earlier this year by Mariangela Bernardi which said that this is the luminosity function. There was another paper uh, earlier this year by Het et al, which said that, uh, you know, depending on how you measure, one of these is the luminosity function. Um, there also is this NASA Sloan Atlas, which does careful photometry um, in the local universe. Uh, this was done by Blanton. Uh, and he seems to agree with Bernardi, at least in these very low, uh, low redshifts. Okay, at less, what's that? Which one is that? Um, it's not on the plot, but I believe it basically is in agreement with the black line. Um, okay, so why does that matter for what I'm talking about? Well, okay, so this is the line, this black line is the relationship between the luminosity of the central galaxy and the mass of the halo that comes out if you use DR7 luminosities. Really, really flat. I mean, like, really flat. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is what comes out if you use the Bernardi results. Um, this is very interesting, right? It's like, can be a factor of four compared to DR7. And then if you believe these recent results about the variation of the, of the IMF, which say that the IMF is different for massive galaxies up here than it is for Milky Way galaxies here. So all of this is done assuming so all of the work on stellar masses generally assumes the same IMF, assumes an IMF appropriate for sort of L-star galaxies maybe. So that will give you basically another factor of two. So the bottom line is potentially an order of magnitude difference in the stellar masses of say a few times 10 to the 14 uh, solar mass halos. So that's interesting. Um, I, you know, anybody who knows about massive galaxies is probably unsurprised by this, who has looked at a lot of pictures. So there's still, I mean, I think there's still some controversy. You know, the, this Bernardi result is a massive extrapolation of what happens um, beyond the radius where you can actually measure the galaxy. So I'd be very interested to hear what people think about this. Um, but my main point is that it's important and it impacts the physical conclusions we, we take from these results. So I don't think there's any confusion about if you give me a label for a galaxy, I know how to, how to, uh, how to get its statistics. And I can confidently predict its statistics. But getting the physics out of this is going to actually require knowing these normalization issues. For very massive objects, right. So for, for galaxies below 10 to the 11 solar masses, we're fine. So I'm really just talking about, well, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's DR7. That's DR7. Yeah. It's DR7. Okay, so I want to say a few more words about uh, the halo properties now. That was about the galaxy properties. Um, so I told you that the best uh, property for matching uh, the, the statistics was this V-peak. Now, we found this interesting result that V-peak seems to happen not at Arvir, um, but at roughly 4 Arvir. Okay, so the peak circular velocity a halo ever had happens well outside the mass of the halo, the radius of the halo, um, at rate of zero, roughly at 4 Arvir. That seems to be independent of the mass of the host that it's falling into. Okay, so it happens at roughly that radius no matter what mass it's going to fall into. 
So that seemed farther out than I would have expected naively. It turns out that V peak is really tracing mergers. Okay, so V peak goes up, increases in a way that the mass doesn't because in a merger the concentration changes. So it turns out that V peak actually is a very good tracer of the last sort of one to five ratio merger. Um, and so even though V peak happens at roughly four RVR, M peak happens at, at about two RVR. So that's interesting. Uh, um, this, I think, is, you know, on average, halos are starting to get stripped even in their mass at roughly 2 RVR, not at RVR. And that relates to a lot of results that people have, have found in the literature, um, you know, that, that you really see the impact of uh, stripping at those radii. So um, one more, one last uh, technical issue that I just want to mention um, relates to the impact of assembly bias. So when people fit uh, halo occupation models, they generally assume that there's no correlation between the galaxy properties um, and the halo properties at a given mass. That's not exactly the assumption in abundance matching because there can be this dependence on the, on the history. Um, the, this, is a, this is a plot made from this recent galaxy catalog by Andrew Heeren where he took, he started with abundance matching and then assigned galaxy color fully essentially based on the, his, the formation history of the halo. Okay? So that's interesting. Um, that's, that results in different clustering predictions. So this shows red galaxies, blue galaxies, and all galaxies. Um, it results in different predictions for the clustering um, because of this fact that the color is directly related to the formation history. Um, what I'm encouraged by, though, is I think we actually, the differences are large enough that we can measure them. Okay? So I'm, this hasn't really been done yet, but I, we, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago where we discussed all of the statistics that one can bring to bear on this problem. Almost all of them have been used in isolated papers, but we have not actually put them all together. So um, I'm quite convinced that actually we can distinguish between these two. The statistical errors on the data are very, very small. So this is an interesting thing to think about. So the last thing I want to say is just that the data is already really good and it's getting better fast. Um, and that means that we really have to think about some of these detailed systematics. Um, so this was an analysis, a joint analysis of galaxy, galaxy lensing, um, galaxy clustering, and the stellar mass function with two square degrees. Um, and uh, in two weeks, we're starting the dark energy survey. We actually already have early data from about 200 square degrees. We just got the, the catalog to this morning um, from this science verification data. But the survey starts in two weeks. This will be a 5,000 square degree survey where we should be able to do galaxy galaxy lensing, um, galaxy cluster lensing, um, you know, the kinds of uh, conditional luminosity functions that you heard about this morning. Um, and to my mind, what this means is we really need to worry a lot more about these data issues and about these issues in the simulations, which I think Anatoly is going to talk about more in a few minutes. So I'll just end there. Thanks. No, it's, the answer to that is a little bit tricky. So it's certainly true that some of this is a definitional issue, and it's a question of, you know, are you cutting the light at a fixed radius versus extrapolating your fit? And in the Bernardi results, she is extrapolating the fit to infinity. Okay, so that is effectively counting the ICL in some way. Now, so in this figure, for example, um, there are a few different 
Uh, there are a few different things here. One actually is a fixed radius. One goes to 1% of the sky background. OK. Um, so I think there's still some controversy about how to extrapolate those fits and what, what it means. But for example, in the SAMs, there, you're not talking about the light within the same kind of radius that, for example, DR7 is measuring it. And so if that's what, so I mean, you know, we've kind of known about these issues for a while, but I think we haven't really understood, you know, how to address them. Charlie. Well, I mean, there's two issues. One was how you extrapolate, but the other was the sky background. Yeah, so, so that is definitely true. So DR8, which doesn't do anything different with the fitting and just changes the analysis of the sky background, actually does look more like this. It doesn't, it's not quite as high as Bernardi. It's about halfway in between the magenta and the black lines. So that's just due to understanding sky subtraction better. ever had. Okay, so it's essentially the mass that it had before it started to get tidally influenced by the by the cluster or group that it fell into. 